And so the Borough Meal Restoration Project started in um, 90, uh, sorry, in 2014, a joint pro uh, project with the Town Council uh, and Lymington Society, um, uh, and they asked us if we would take charge of this to try and restore the site of the monument and the monument itself. Uh, and so who was Sir Harry? Well, Sir Harry Burrard Neal was part of the Burrard family. The Burrard family were the family that owned Warhampton House. They had, a, um, they had a seat, they had a parliamentary seat in their pocket, as it was called. And the two uh, Burrard brothers married the two Button brothers, sisters. The, the Button sisters lived at Button Manor. Um, and between them, they had two pockets seats. Um, the Buttons and the Burrards pocketed the whole place. They had two seats in Parliament. It's an amazing thing to talk about the Royal Navy in the period that Sir Harry joined and, and, and then served all his life in. 1688 to 1815, some historians call this the Second Hundred Years' War, because it is a period of a series of wars. The Nine Years' War, the War of Spanish Succession, Rod Jenkins is here, the War of Austrian Succession, the Seven Years' War, the American Revolutionary Wars, the French Revolutionary Wars, and the Polar Wars. So, and taken as a whole, it's this period of gigantic, epic struggle between Britain and France, largely. Uh, not just for, not as, as medieval England had fought for empire and territory in France. No, this is for a battle for global domination. And it would only end with complete global domination, complete <coughs> victory of one side or another. It could have been British, could have been French. But it ended with British victory. It ended with British troops watering their horses in the Seine. It ended with the Duke of Wellington spending time with Napoleon's former mistress. It ended with British troops occupying Paris. And it could easily have ended. There were periods when it looked like it might um, work the other way as well. And the consequences of that gigantic victory are all around us this day. English, global language. Uh, Anglo-Saxon ideas of law, the Protestant religion, of economics, of industry, of politics, spread all over the world. So men like Tyrone O'Neill played their part in a Royal Navy who were, that, was forging, that was forging destiny not to this country but, but of the whole world. So from the very beginning of the Navy there is a culture of meritocracy. And you see that with Sir Francis Drake and the Tudors. There's a great expression, Sir Francis Drake said, I'd rather have a man that can rather have an officer that can haul and draw along with the men. It's a great line from Swan Street. People say all the time, Britain is an island. You know, what, isn't it wonderful? No one ever invades Britain. Nonsense, Britain got invaded constantly in the medieval period. The French hopped across the channel. Talk about those citizens of Southampton, where do you think those big walls came from? Southampton was laid waste, I think it was in the 14th century. Could be the 13th. Uh, enslaved, burned to the ground. And that was just one of many little raids. The French came at will, just as we went across at will. And what stops, what protects British shores are not the White Cliffs Dover, it's not the sea. The sea is actually a bridge, it's not a barrier at all. It's much easier to get on a boat in Calais and pop across to Kent than it is to walk across the Pennines. Complete nightmare. But uh, it's very easy to get across the Channel. Hence, uh, you know, the closeness of, of Cornwall and Brittany, the relationships, the language, the intermarriage that went on. What, stop, what, what allows Britain to protect itself is the ships, the Royal Navy. And, and it becomes the central strategic... Uh, the, the 18th, 17th, 18th century politicians can't agree about anything else apart from that navy needs to be strong. Some want a big army, some want no army, some want king, some want no king, some want this... But the navy had to be strong, and that becomes this binding principle of, of British policymakers. And it meant that the navy was always well-funded. Not, you know, Charles II cut a few corners, but I mean, the na broadly speaking, the navy was well-funded. And, and the British state transforms itself literally into it's called the historians call it a fiscal military state. You raise taxes to pay for a navy that protects trade, and they, the trade is your tax. No income tax in this period, not till the end. Income tax introduced in the Napoleonic Wars by Pitt. Promised it was temporary. Um, <laughs> and in the Seven Years' War, which is a period that I know a fair bit about, that um, Sir Harry was born just after, in the dying days of. Um, it is, it's this mir miraculous war. It's, Winston Churchill called it the First World War. There was fighting on every continent, and Britain wins ev everywhere. The, my favourite battle in the 18th century, well, we should all have one, favourite naval battle, uh, is not Trafalgar. That's really for amateurs, I'm afraid. The Battle of Quiberon Bay, ladies and gentlemen. There you go, sailors in this room. Proper sailors. 1759, November. 
on a, on a rising gale in, in a, at dusk. A British fleet crowds on sail, sails into Quiberon Bay full of rocks and shoals to pursue the fleeing French who are trying to launch an invasion of Britain uh, and fight this extraordinarily one-sided battle against this French fleet, just crushing them. Um, a, an absolutely brilliant demonstration of gunnery, of seamanship, of navigation, uh, astonishing battle. In the, in the 17, mid 18th century, the British realised that they can maintain a permanent blockading force off French ports. This is game changing. You don't just turn up and hope you're going to sort of burn a few trading ships and then run out of fresh water and run out and then get scurvy and go back to Plymouth. You, you maintain position sailing up and down off French ports year round, virtually. Brest, uh, Calais, these, these ports are closed, permanently closed. The economy destroyed. The ability of the French Navy to recruit, to train, to practice, to go to sea, destroyed. So after the American War of Independence, Sir Harry comes back to the UK. As you've heard, he plays a key pivotal part of the mutiny at the Nore. And I'd like to say a little bit more about the mutinies at Spithead in the Nore, 1797. They are moments, again, they are moments in which the entire British project hung in the balance. Uh, they are moments in which the fleet, which was the ultimate saint, the ultimate guardian, the ultimate protector of the British state, the entire British project. The fleet was potentially in a political... Uh, the, the spithead was more about pay and conditions. To be fair, they hadn't had a pay rise since I think it was 1693. Uh, and so there, was, there were pay and conditions problems at spithead. But on the Nore, you do get, you do get revolutionary, you get political activity. You get individuals coming forward to, trying to do a, a Robespierre or Napoleon. And it therefore is a moment of supreme danger to the British state. There's a wonderful story at the Nore where uh, an admiral uh, attempted to, Admiral Duncan was, was in charge of trying to deal with this, with this fleet in the Nore. They were blockading London, totally un unimaginable. The Royal Navy blockading London. I mean, this is Armageddon. Uh, he tried to, tried to do, he, he was trying to deal with the, with the mutiny, a mixture of, of, of a carrot and stick. But he had a problem, which was that the Dutch fleet, if they heard that the Royal Navy was mutant, the Dutch fleet would leave. And at this point, the Dutch had joined the French, um, unwillingly, but they had. Uh, and so he, Admiral Duncan does something very special, which is he takes his ship, which had remained loyal, um, and he, uh, he, with two ships, he blockades the Dutch Navy. At that time, probably the third largest navy in the world, with two ships. And he goes up and down. Each night, they repaint the ships to make them look different. And all day... <laughs> All day they're signalling an imaginary fleet out to sea. Yeah, no, brilliant. We're glad you're all there, but um, we've got this for the moment. Don't worry about it. We're fine. Um, the weather then looks perfect for the Dutch to leave harbour. Um, two more ships join. So he's now got four ships. He orders them to anchor in the main channel. If you think of a map of Holland, there's that sort of huge inland sea. So at the, at the, where that inland sea comes into the North Sea, he orders them to anchor four abreast, four in line in that channel. They are to fight to the last round and then sink themselves to try and block the channel. And that is the Royal Navy. Uh, at the Battle of Trafalgar, 21 enemy ships were captured and one was destroyed for the loss of zero ships. Um, and he was uh, made Commander-in-Chief of the Mediterranean Fleet in 1823. And I just want to quickly say uh, why that's important, really. Um, uh, these people, no radio, no telegrams, nothing. When you, when you appoint someone commander of the Mediterranean fleet, you're enabling a single commander to make gigantic political decisions. Uh, and, um, and so these, being, being commander chief of the Mediterranean fleet was not just a job, not just an admiral, was a, a profoundly important, one of, the most, you know, one of the most important figures in Europe. And for example, his successor, Codrington, just annihilated the Ottoman fleet off the coast of Greece and basically facilitated Greek independence. The, that's, the, that's the importance that these men are, 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 are the, of the decisions they're making. We should also say, of course, you become very rich. Prize money was a, a, a key. One of the reasons we, we talk about the aggression, we talk about, well, they liked capturing enemy ships because they made a lot of money out of them as well. Um, and so you see these men like Sanders, like Nelson, like uh, Collingwood, like Saumarez, uh, and like Barad Neal, who are able to reach the very zenith of the British military, political, economic... Uh, state through through the uh, through the exercise of violence against His Majesty's enemies. 
Um, that was my quick rampage through the whole of 8th century naval history. But by all means, you know, pick things out and um, let me know if I, you want to talk about more about anything else. <laughs> Young man, go for it. What are three things you should learn in history? Yeah. Don't trust what you read on Facebook. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm serious. One thing history tells you, right, is that history is all about working out what happened. And it's about going, hang on, I've got a report here from the Admiral saying the Admiral was fantastic and made all the right decisions. I got a report here from the Captain saying the Admiral was completely useless. So what do I do about this? The answer is you look for other sources. You try and work it out. You try and think, well, who's more likely to be correct here? Who's got... Le who's got and so that is one, that's the big lesson from history. And Britain voluntarily gave up it's two power, it had this kind of two power rule, which the British Navy said for 300 years, we need to be able to fight and win against the two next biggest navies on planet Earth. And Britain gave that up in the 1920s because the public said, I mean, look, I love dreadnought, I love super dreadnought battleships, but I'd rather have you know, a pension. I think what's so exciting and wonderful about the Royal Navy in the 8th century is a great lesson to all of us is the, is the joy of the system, is that you can create, we humans are so frail and capricious but we can build heroes you know whether we're looking for teachers or we're looking for great nurses and doctors and scientists if you put the conditions in place and have exams and fun teacher training and whatever it might be you there are there are nelsons and collingwoods and jarvises and burrard neils in every generation and actually because the great thing of course nelson dies and everyone's sad no impact doesn't matter you don't need nelson Nelson came from a navy that didn't need a Nelson. He was a bonus. But Burrard Neal would have won Trafalgar. Jo Colin would have won Trafalgar. And there's a few bad eggs, like Graves at Chesapeake Bay. But on the whole, you've got, this, you've got this bench that is so strong because you've got a system that just spits out heroes. Okay.